Hi everyone, my name is Anna. I'm from the National Center for Healthy Housing. Thanks for joining our April webinar. Um, we have our presenters from the Green and Healthy Homes Initiative um, here to talk about um, lead poisoning prevention programs in the Baltimore and Maryland areas. And we are gonna talk about how these programs can be used as case studies and the lessons that can be learned for other jurisdictions. Um, we have quite a few attendees jumping on. Um, so Ruthann, I'm gonna hand it over to you and we can get started. Well, that's great. And uh, I wanted to just uh, welcome our partners here from the Maryland Department of the Environment, as well as the Deputy Secretary, Arashia Tablada, and the Director of the Land Materials uh, Administration, Kaylee Lilliker. And uh, Kaylee, I apologize if I did not get that right. What we hope to have today is to show you the strength of a community-based uh, partnership with state and local government uh, that has brought about a phenomenal public health story in Maryland and the things that we're doing to continue that story moving forward. So, and, uh, and I'll talk about where the uh, Maryland law as it has been constructed, how we stepped into it and stepped up to it in partnership with our rental property community and now with our uh, general public uh, community uh, over time. But I first wanna turn this over to the Maryland Department of the Environment uh, and let them take the first couple of slides. So uh, Mr. Secretary, Deputy Secretary, and uh, Ms. Lelliker, I'll turn this over to you. Hey, Ruth Ann, thank you so much, everybody. Thanks for joining us. This is Ben Grumbles, the Secretary of Maryland Department of the Environment. And Kaylee, I, I don't know if you're on. I, I don't have any slides to talk about. I just wanted to simply say at the outset that in Maryland, we're very proud of the work that the General Assembly uh, did in the last few weeks, ushering in uh, and working closely with the Hogan administration on uh, passage of two very important laws relating to uh, uh, lead paint poisons and poisons in the home uh, that lead can present, but also uh, the, uh, an important step forward in testing for lead in drinking water at schools uh, throughout the state. So um, thanks so much to the Green and Healthy Homes uh, uh, folks for their uh, leadership and getting legislators to find common ground for the common good and to make some serious and important steps forward for public health. We appreciate you, Mr. Secretary, and your unbelievable partnership and everything from helping us get universal screening in uh, Maryland to adding in uh, lead dust clearance testing uh, during your period for all of our work that we do in rental housing and to this most important bill that lowers the lead level um, and ties it to environmental intervention. So thank you for uh, yeah. joining uh, Ruth Ann uh, H.T. Horacio Tablada, who's the Deputy Secretary for Maryland Department of the Environment, is is here and is, is going to uh, go through the slides. Uh, and uh, for those of you who haven't met Kaylee Lalliker, she's the head of our uh, uh, Land and Materials Department. And uh, it is a good teamwork uh, and, a, and a good partnership with a variety of important players, public and private sector throughout Maryland. So. Horacio, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Hello, good afternoon, everyone. And this is a good afternoon here in, in Annapolis, Maryland. Uh, so the, uh, I'm Deputy Secretary of MDE, Department of the Environment. Uh, I have been with the uh, department many years and, and for the last, uh, since the year 2000, I was, I was, uh, personally have been involved in many, many legislative and regulatory initiatives regarding uh, lead poisoning prevention. It is our passionate, uh, our passion at MDE to, to one day completely eradicate uh, the totally preventable uh, disease. And so I don't know if the, you guys can see the slide I'm, I have, I'm, with the history of Maryland's lead law. I just wanna highlight a few of those where that have been very important to us. Can everybody see those? Yes, yes. All right, history, see in 1994, that's when the first lead poison prevention bill uh, was introduced, which was the main piece of legislation that set 
the uh, the prevention of lead poisoning in the state of Maryland. Uh, this was a, a, as a result of a, of a several studies that had been done before. Uh, so this was a major uh, piece of legislation, and it had two main goals. One was to prevent a lead poisoning prevention on children or risk population at risk, and also to continue with affordable housing. Everybody felt that you know you needed to have both of them in play because uh, you know obviously if you have all the money in the world, you can totally eradicate lead, poison, lead in paint and lead in the housing. And so we felt that uh, at that time the General Assembly in Maryland adopted a preventable measures, a registration program uh, that required the rental properties to be registered with the state and also required the, uh, some measures, the technical measures to be done prior to the houses being rented out, which is what we call risk reductions. Uh, obviously, we preferred uh, lead abatement, but in this case, risk reduction included uh, ensuring that there was no chipping, uh, peeling, flaking paint, and uh, included that, um, that there be uh, some treatments done in the home uh, at the time before renting. And so the, the, these are the, the regulations that resulted in to implement this law were adopted in February 1996. In the year 2000, this is a key year, that's when I really became involved myself. Uh, that's when the governor at the time felt that the LEP program, yes, we had a good law, good legislation, but it was lacking the resources needed to fight uh, lead poison prevention. So uh, um, about $5 million was invested in that year on a per year basis into the state. Uh, and, and some money, a million dollars came to the Department of the Environment to hire inspectors, attorneys, and, and to really begin implementing the law. Uh, a million dollars went to the health department to continue doing surveillance of the children, and about three million went to the housing department of the state of Maryland to uh, provide loans and grants and for people that couldn't afford uh, or needed help financially to restore the homes. So that was a major piece of legislation uh, budgetarily in the year 2000. In 2004 and uh, five, there was uh, there were and specifically in 2005, that's when another major piece of legislation uh, by the governor at the time were reduced the level of uh, action level from 15 to 10 milli micrograms per deciliter, uh, which became effective in 2006. And those uh, that was a major piece because, uh, as you know, the there's no amount of lead that is uh, uh, acceptable, and so we. And you know, with and on the device main and working with the property owners and with the coalition with Ruth Ann in particular, we say we need to go lower so we can protect more children. And the, in 2008, there was a lead containing uh, a bill related to children's uh, lead products in for children, and that was something that we begin noticing that not just poison was occurring from lead paint, but also from products like toys and things like that. So this legislation passed on and, uh, and, and hopefully also working with the, at the national level, a lot of the products now have either indicators or that they have lead or don't have lead. And this is what uh, we're working with, you know, dealing with the products. In 2012, that was another, uh, in 2011, there was a summer study that we wanted to say, okay, how do we get to the last to re totally eradicate lead poisoning, prevention, lead poisoning among children. And, uh, and so we did it, there was a summer study, a lot of people came together and said, okay, we need to, <clears throat> to address areas where really we're seeing the, where we're seeing the poisoning occurring. So in 2012, we expanded the coverage to all pre-78 rental properties. Uh, just to back up, in, in the 94 law dealt primarily with the 19 rental properties built prior to 1950. And the reason that was because in Baltimore City, the, the lead paint, uh, paint containing lead uh, was uh, prohibited after 1950. I mean, nationally, 
as you all know, the the lead in paint stopped in 1978. So it was just made sense to because we were noticing that there were children being poisoned in homes built between 1950 and 78. So to expand the per same program to all unit rental properties built prior to 1978, and uh, and that was. Uh, expand there was a major uh, initiative and with that in 2016 in March 2016 uh, the health department by regulation not by by law by by, by statute by by regulation uh, adopted rec where we call now the universal testing prior to that the people that were tested for lead the children were children all children in Baltimore City and children uh, living at risk areas. Those at risk areas were defined by by the number of children that were uh, with lead poisoning. So not the whole not uh, the whole state was not tested. The, the children, the entire state were not tested. So in 2016, we say you know we we may be missing children that need to be tested, and sometimes children go to the different homes, and so and play in playgrounds and get different ways you can get poisoning. So we increase universal made universal testing mandatory and uh, that's in the regs right now as part of the health department. Every child in Maryland at the age of one and two years old get tested for lead. And obviously they get, get tested more frequent if the pediatrician thinks it's necessary. And I know that from personal experience because my granddaughter who is almost five, she gets tested fairly frequent because she lives in Baltimore City. And thank God she's always been let free. Uh, now in 2017, we begin changing focus to letting drinking water, because uh, in, as in the heels of the Flint, Michigan case and things like that, we be, and knowing the schools in Maryland may have older piping and faucets. So there was an, a legislation that was passed and that uh, strongly supported by the secretary uh, Secretary Grombo that just spoke, and he uh, and we were able to to get lead in drinking water at schools uh, passed. So every schools, private and public schools in Baltimore, in Maryland, uh, need to have testing, not just the water that's consumed by the children, but also the water used in the kitchen and different areas of the school. And there, a lot of schools are going through the process right now, or have completed the process. And obviously, they have to find lead in the water. They have to stop the source and, and uh, stop the the water level there. And more recent, the one just built right now that was passed, and Kaylee uh, will talk about it in the next slide. But if you switch to the next slide, that's a, our graph that shows a 98% line in children in lead poisoning. And you you see where those high the ones in green, kind of you can see where those are linked to the major pieces of legislation, where the good legislation, good policy, will always result in lowering uh, cases of lead poisoning. And and we're our goal obviously, even though we are down to very low levels, we will continue this fight until there is no children in Maryland, and and hopefully in the United States with any lead poisoning at all. And we have seen this 98% decline over the years, over 25, 26 years, and it's a good success, yet we're not uh, there yet. We would definitely need to uh, relentlessly, relentlessly fight for the remaining uh, 300 and some. And if you include, this is only for the 10 and above, so if you include the five and above, it's about another uh, 1,500 uh, children, uh, but it's the same graph that you see in reduction. So now, Kaylee will talk about the recent legislation that was passed unanimously by everyone in the General Assembly, and in full cooperation with the the advocates like Ruth Ann and the property owners and the and the elected officials. So with that, I'm going to. To, to sign off because I got to go to another meeting, but uh, I'm glad that this is a national discussion and I hope and, uh, and anticipate that good results will come 
out of uh, this uh, webinar. And um, thank you very much. Great, Kaylee. All right, thank you. Um, so as Horacio mentioned, um, this session, um, there was a very important bill that was passed by the General Assembly that um, takes another step forward to strengthen our, our lead law. And the bill is called the Maryland Healthy Children Act. And what it does is lowers the elevated blood lead level that triggers certain interventions um, under our law that will protect children from further lead exposure. So currently in our law, um, an elevated blood lead level or an EBL um, is defined as a level of 10 micrograms per deciliter or higher. And that has been the level in, in the law since um, 2006. So in 2012, um, the CDC revised its guidelines. Um, and it uses, now uses a lead reference level of five micrograms per deciliter. So this bill that just passed in Maryland um, establishes the low, this lower CDC reference level as the EBL that triggers actions under our law. So um, currently the department operates a lead surveillance system um, where we receive the results of all blood lead testing throughout the state. And under this bill, when, whenever a child under the age of six or pregnant woman is tested with um, an EBL equal to or greater than that reference level, um, the department will notify the child's parent or guardian or, or the pregnant woman, as well as the property owner. Um, so these notifications at that lower um, EBL level will start in October of this year. Um, case management um, by the department and the local health departments um, will also start to be triggered at this lower EBL level. So um, part of the case management that um, currently for EBL 10 or above um, consists of an environmental investigation where the department or the local health department um, goes out to the property and identifies all the lead child's environment. So the bill um, requires the department to adopt new regulations um, that will lay out the process for doing these environmental investigations. Um, and those procedures um, have to be consistent with the HUD guidelines for environmental investigations. Um, so by July of 2020, um, we will have adopted those regulations and we will start doing the environmental investigations for all um, children under the age of six or pregnant women who have an EBL at that lower um, CDC reference level. And then the last bill deals with um, property owners' obligations under our lead law. So um, as Horacio mentioned, um, under the uh, owners of pre-1978 residential rental properties have to register their, their property department and um, satisfy reduction standards at certain events. So there's two types of risk reduction standards. Um, there's a full risk reduction standard, which um, has to be satisfied on each change in occupancy of the rental property. Um, and that consists of an inspection of the property to make sure that there's no chipping, peeling, or flaking paint, plus um, passing a test for lead contaminated dust. The other um, risk reduction standard is called the modified risk reduction standard, and that's a um, a little bit more stringent standard. It um, consists of the requirements for the full risk reduction standard plus additional uh, lead hazard reduction treatments which are listed in the, the statute. So the modified standard is triggered in, in two situations um, currently. First is whenever there's an EBL of a person at risk residing in that um, pre-78 rental property and then also whenever a property owner is provided notice um, that there's a defect in the property, even if there's no elevated blood lead level. So under this new bill, um, instead of the modified risk reduction standard being triggered automatically when there's an EBL at or above the 10 micrograms per deciliter level, it will be triggered if there is an EBL at the lower um, CDC reference level and if the environmental investigation showed that there was a, a defect in the property. 
Um, it would still continue to also be triggered anytime there's a notice of defect. So that, that part of the law would remain unchanged. Um, so the point of tying that modified risk reduction um, standard to the confirmed um, presence of a lead paint hazard is to make sure that you know efforts are being targeted to measures that are likely to address hazards um, contrib actually contributing to that child's blood lead level. Um, and the changes to the modified risk reduction um, will also take place July 2020, the same date that we start doing those um, environmental investigations on the lower levels. Oops. Oh, sorry. 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 Um, so, um, as, as we saw on that graph, um, since the, the law was in, originally enacted in 1994, there's been a lot of progress um, in reducing childhood lead poisoning. Um, in 2017, we had um, 260 confirmed cases of EBL of 10 micrograms per deciliter or higher. So the confirmed cases are the ones that uh, received the environmental investigations. Um, for levels between of five to nine micrograms per, de per deciliter in comparison, there were 900 cases of confirmed EBLs. So these additional 900 cases represent additional children that will receive the notification, environmental investigations, and potentially modified risk reduction under this new bill. So it's it's really important um, step for addressing um, lead hazards at those lower blood levels, um, and the hope being that we can prevent the higher levels from occurring. So. It's also going to bring us in line with the CDC guidance, um, and we think will get us one step closer toward our, our ultimate goal of eliminating childhood lead poisoning. So, uh, Ruth Ann, with that, I'll turn it back over to you. Great, and thank you very much. So, let me take everybody uh, on a journey of how we got here, how we built this, and then what we are doing as we move forward. And I want to thank the folks at MDE. Um, for um, to really uh, uh, put this in place. It takes the government agencies to move this forward. That has included um, not only the um, department's uh, program, but the enforcement attorneys at the state attorney general's office and the city of Baltimore. And the city of Baltimore uh, most recently has aligned a lot of their landlord licensing and uh, requirements to uh, coincide and include, obviously, uh, over the years, the Maryland uh, Lead Risk Reduction and Housing Law. So if you rent in Baltimore, our largest city and the largest uh, concentration of lead poisoning, you're required to also be in full compliance. But this is, a, this is a picture and a headline that I keep in my office to remind me every day of the work uh, that we're doing and why we're doing it. These are kids who uh, dressed up uh, to uh, protest at City Hall, the failure to have uh, effective guidelines and regulations that were protecting them. And the, the, they, so they dressed up as canaries in the coal mine and tried to do this work. But it is the Baltimore Sun headline I like to point to as we start to tell this story, where the, the Sun, our largest newspaper, um, and at the time one of the largest newspapers in the country, basically told us that our efforts uh, to uh, reduce lead poisoning, to declare war, and to have a successful campaign uh, was doomed to fail. And I love it when people challenge us uh, when we know what's good and right ahead. In 1993, in the first walk of neighborhoods and mapping uh, that we did uh, when I joined the coalition uh, as its first employee, we were finding neighborhoods that had elevated blood lead levels of for kids tested with levels over 10, as high as 82% in neighborhoods. Lead poisoning, unhealthy housing, and other conditions related to that had effectively been normalized uh, in Maryland and in Baltimore in particular. And this the, obviously had quite a challenge. We had 1,400 cases that were going into the Baltimore City Circuit Court every year. Um, around uh, landlords who were being sued for lead poisoning. And uh, there was a lot of uh, 
constructive eviction happening, illegal eviction happening for families who were reporting on that their kids had lead levels, and the whole system uh, was in a state of paralysis. So we knew that we had to do things. And so I won't cover all of this because Horatio did, but in a city that in 1951 was the first city in the nation to ban the use of lead-based paint in residential housing, the uh, passage of the Maryland Lead Risk Reduction and Housing Law set up at the time a uh, compromise system that if property owners did things to reduce lead hazards in their home, it did not at the time include dust testing, although we tried to get it through, that we would have a fund to provide relocation and some medical expenses um, in trade for liability protection. That liability protection piece that we were not, uh, that uh, the coalition was not in support of, but it was had been included by the legislature, was later overturned as unconstitutional. So the law we have today is a strict liability law. But we added in uh, that we were blood, kind of blood lead tests, not only at ages of one and two in at-risk areas, uh, but that we would also require the proof of blood lead testing before kids went into pre-K, K, or first grade, and we still do that today, to ensure that kids have been tested. We strengthened our rental escrow laws to ensure uh, that uh, uh, rental escrow could be used as a, a quasi-private sector enforcement. And we also had uh, preventions against uh, retaliatory evictions built in to that law. In 2000, what is not on this uh, slide, but maybe in the slides coming, uh, we built a big strategic plan around lead and uh, got the new mayor uh, in Baltimore to do enforcement. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that in a second. Um, but one of the other things that we did in the early 2000s is to say that use of the rent court was an effective way to help do enforcement alongside state and local agencies. But we needed to put a provision in <clears throat> that said lead, uh, chipping, peeling, plate, flaking paint in Maryland uh, in pre-1950 and then pre-78 was presumed to have lead. Compliance with that law was critical to public health and required of all rental property owners. So we passed a law called the Clean Hands Bill that said the property owners have to come to court with clean hands, meaning be in full compliance with the law. If they are not, they cannot use the rent court to gain um, money and uh, to take the tenant to court for non-payment. So they had to come as a compliant landlord in order to use the rent court. It had a very big effect on our ability to move and advance our uh, lead poisoning prevention rates. We also added in 2008 uh, a relocation assistance fund that actually started to build in 2006. Um, and then we built that out. In 2011, we added mandatory lead dust clearance testing to all pre-78 units uh, in the state, or as we started to move that forward, 2016 universal testing, and as we talked about, the lowering of the threshold level uh, this year, and tying that inspection of primary, secondary, and tertiary sources to environmental interventions. And we also passed a bill the first of what will be an additional, I think, piece of legislation next year to address schools that are, that are showing elevated blood, uh, elevated water, uh, lead and water levels, and tied it to a $30 million fund uh, that schools can access uh, for cleanup. So this is uh, quite helpful in looking at our work. So the base law, we, uh, the, as we call the Maryland Lead Risk uh, uh, Reduction of Lead Risk and Housing Law, passed in 1994, went into effect in 1996, and was eventually expanded to do all uh, pre-78 rental properties throughout the state, um, and has had a big impact in how we uh, will talk about the data on that. We baseline, we require every unit, not just property, but every unit of rental housing in the state to pay a $30 annual fee to help support the work at the Maryland Department of the Environment, its inspection process, and its education process. Um, 
and GHHI holds the uh, contract for that public education and tenant representation and counseling. It requires that lead risk reduction inspection certificate must be in hand prior to occupancy and could have been done no earlier than 50 days prior because we don't want a period for uh, deterioration to occur. Owners must give what is called a notice of defect and of tenant's rights uh, as well at, at the time of occupancy. And they must respond to a notice of defect if uh, a tenant during occupancy fills that out and says there's a structural defect or child with an elevated blood lead level or something that is causing paint to chip, peel, or flake. Owners must respond and do a full uh, investigation, remediation, and thus clearance within 30 days of that as well. Um, and then we have an education piece of that has to go in addition to the notice of uh, tenants' rights is the federal protector family uh, from land in the home, as well as the pr proof of the certificate. So we started as we uh, wanted to continue to strengthen that law, adding rental escrow as a strong uh, private enforcement system. It has been used uh, almost daily in our state to be advancing uh, landlord work to reduce lead hazards. We did the clean hands bill. We had the relocation assistance built in, um, not only a fund that we created in 2006, but to hold owners accountable to pay for relocation uh, through the rental escrow uh, process, all of it having to show that wherever a family is moved to, it must meet the state law pass dust clearance and have a uh, cert certificate showing its compliance. Um, the state uh, of Maryland issues about 400 to 800 notices of violation annually in the state of Maryland. Fines have uh, ranged from small amounts, uh, literally into the hundreds of thousands of dollars. If you are enforced by the state of Maryland um, under this law, you not only have to clean up your current property, uh, that is the offending property, but all of your properties have to be brought up um, to compliance and the state also very often will require a window replacement and other measures that are not uh, required in the baseline law. Uh, so the whole portfolio is the action along with uh, cash fines uh, there. MDE has uh, about four to five full-time attorney generals that are augmented uh, by uh, attorneys in the city of Baltimore and in counties uh, throughout the state, um, all and all of this uh, built around registration compliance, uh, certificate compliance, and response to notice of defect uh, compliance. Uh, and uh, just on the notice of defect and referrals um, for enforcement, those notice of defects can be executed uh, by the tenants or by community organizations, tenant advocates, or others on behalf of and with the tenants. They're stronger if the tenant themselves is doing that. Um, there is a way in the state also that uh, prospective renters can go on to the state housing department uh, website and the MDE website and to view the compliance status of every unit. Uh, but the commitment to enforcement is something I want to talk about as people think about uh, the courage to not only have standards, but enforce those standards. When we finally got Baltimore City to join in to enforcement efforts um, on this law and on the, the compliance with lead risk reduction and prevention, that had been absent in the previous 12 years in the city. When Martin O'Malley was elected governor or uh, mayor at the time, he later became our governor, he immediately uh, responded to a, the strategic plan that we had written called Windows of Opportunity um, and started the enforcement of Baltimore City properties through the lead violation notice. And within three years, 45% of the 99% reduction that we've had in the city occurred simply by implementing the enforcement of the laws as they stood. So the enforcement actions also included uh, in Baltimore established that year was a statting process to, called LEDSTAT to track the data of, of where houses were being made lead safe, lead free, risk reduced, where enforcements had occurred. Um, 
And we also uh, passed a local ordinance for probable cause allowing that if there was one um, unit in a building where a child had been poisoned or there was found to be a violation notice, that the city had the right to inspect the entire building under probable cause. The city and county uh, registrations uh, or licensing offices throughout Maryland refer non-compliance. Uh, it's another big part of having that compliance effort. Um, they refer into MDE for enforcement. The Housing Choice Voucher Section 8 owners must, in Maryland must also show compliance with the state law. Uh, in, especially in Baltimore City, if you want to be an eligible uh, housing choice voucher property, you must be in compliance. <clears throat> and we have a dedicated district court housing dock uh, every Wednesday for lead cases uh, and lead violation cases in many cities like St. Louis and Philadelphia and others. There's a dedicated lead court. This is very much akin to that uh, and is part of the enforcement actions uh, that come out of our district court uh, in rental housing. Um, and then we have partnered uh, with Housing Code Enforcement. We have uh, GHHI has helped to retrain the entire Baltimore City Housing Code inspectors uh, on the citation of chipping, peeling, flaking paint, but not only that, the necessary steps that need to happen for those folks to understand the entire process, which makes them better inspectors and how to look more holistically uh, with lead as one symptom, but to look at health and housing overall. The city web portal created a way to look up current past housing code violations, including lead violations, uh, which have been posted um, and, and are being posted. And Baltimore City Housing Code Enforcement refers those code violations that cite pip, chipping paint automatically uh, to MDE if they remain unsatisfied. So there's great coordination uh, that happens between the health department and the housing department, the health department and uh, GHHI under business associate agreements and HIPAA, but also amongst the housing enforcement agencies uh, to do joint enforcements or to ensure that no property is falling through. Um, also in Baltimore, we established standards for demolition to look at lead uh, dust, clear, uh, lead dust uh, loadings um, and put together a best practice out of East Baltimore. Uh, this was authored by uh, GHHI. One of our expert panelists was Dave Jacobs uh, from the center. We were glad, very glad to have that. Uh, this has been replicated in a number of cities across the country, but also put into law in Baltimore and is also part of the standards used by the state of Maryland uh, for demolition. They, and they do their demolition, interesting or oddly enough, through the Maryland Stadium Authority uh, when the state uh, wants to do property uh, demolition. We passed as well, uh, as uh, Deputy Tablada noted, a lead and products ban. It was one of the first states in the country to put bans on leaded jewelry and toys and other uh, products. Uh, it was one of the first looks at lead and food that I know EDF is doing a great job of looking at. Um, and uh, we have passed a statute whose regulations are still being um, reviewed for implementation that will require lead dust clearance testing at the end of every RRP job done under uh, the EPA regulations in homeowner occupied properties and those that do not uh, fall under the Maryland Lead Risk Reduction and Housing Act. So we're pretty serious about lead poisoning in Maryland and what we can do uh, to advance that. On the outreach side, we've done some pretty interesting uh, instru uh, work that has helped us. Uh, we are big believers in free media uh, and try to utilize that. In fact, uh, a recent search uh, showed over 400 articles on lead. Uh, in the in the last uh, couple of decades that I've been working in this area, we did we also used the work in Maryland to be a launch for a national ad council campaign that ran for three years. Uh, we are looking at another uh, national campaign um, on lead, and we'll be looking uh, to do one more succinct and direct to actions that can be taken by grassroots uh, communities, by mayors, and uh, uh, 
very uh, local localized groups uh, and will be educational but also uh, actionable. Um, and then we have very strong client referral ne networks from our uh, all of our health clinics, our government agencies, our housing agencies, our civic agencies, all moving um, to move referrals quickly and preventively uh, where we can uh, around the chipping paint issue, not waiting uh, for kids to get poisoned, but part of our Align Braid Coordinate holistic look at environmental health and uh, assessments uh, in every home in Baltimore. Um, we've established uh, in Baltimore also one of the nation's first, if not the nation's first, housing choice voucher program for lead affected uh, families, 250 vouchers in cycle uh, to help families move where other actions are not happening uh, and to move them into lead safe and lead free properties. We have a, a annual CDBG uh, contribution to relocation um, and we've had investments of putting lead in all policies state and city uh, policy is that if you are taking state or city money to do housing uh, repair or renovation you must meet uh, the state's lead safe standard uh, which is stricter than the epa rrp uh, standard also we have uh, worked with the, our state health department uh, to secure uh, money through the children's health insurance program uh, to do annually uh, to do that work uh, on lead hazard control throughout the state, in addition to the other uh, direct grants that we did uh, through HUD when they were giving grants to nonprofits. Um, and then uh, I think one of the bigger things is the universal blood lead testing has been really magnificent for getting everyone to wake up and pay attention on the need uh, to not only get their child tested, but their home tested and uh, really uh, looking at the expanse of that now, looking as I said, at, at housing, at soil, at water, and other sources such as uh, makeup and um, home remedies uh, and pottery. So we're looking at that primary, secondary, and tertiary in addition to aggressive screening of our children. Um, and that's what the Healthy Children's Act kind of brings together uh, those two. Um, and thank Robin Lewis, our delegate, uh, where our offices are at GHHI <clears throat> for bringing this forward for us and uh, championing this bill. Um, we continue in Baltimore to be troubled by the lead and water uh, in our school system, but not only in Baltimore, in Anne Arundel County, Howard County, and Montgomery County, some of our wealthier counties. Montgomery County just passed uh, its own piece of legislation that lowers the parts per billion from 20 to five. It ties money into the ability to uh, remediate the uh, fixtures, put filters on, uh, which is replicating and, and mirroring some of the state bill uh, that we passed. We also have standards around uh, paint and water uh, for schools that we have strengthened uh, through legislation. And as I noted, we have a chip uh, waiver um, or program for lead hazard control is now at 14.4 million uh, soon to go up again to 21 will be 21 million it's about 7.2 million a year uh, ghhi's uh, own contract to train train community health workers to do outreach and education on lead and asthma <clears throat> serves as part of the match so if you're interested in your state uh, getting a chip program and how to creatively and thoughtfully come up with the matching funds needed, uh, we would be happy to help you. We worked very closely with our Medicaid director, Shannon McMahon, here in Maryland, as well as working with CMS on Michigan, Ohio, Indiana, and other places. Um, and we're, we're very proud of the work we have done here in Baltimore, where we have a, in our GHHI place-based work, where it is a full circle um, in service uh, from and, and looking at the family's home to legal services, relocation services, our own crews who do the work and the case management. Um, we've done over 4,100 uh, lead and hazard reduction um, houses. We've served directly in Baltimore over 20,000 low-income uh, clients 
with these direct services uh, use, utilizing our comprehensive assessment model, uh, which has been adopted by the state of Maryland as well, um, and has collectively produced a 98% decline in Maryland um, and a 99% decline in Baltimore City, uh, where we have tracked from 93 uh, to 2016 and 2017 and 18 numbers as well show uh, similar results um, on that reduction. And that reduction, Duke University says, the Nicholson Center did a study that says that it has returned $44.5 billion of economic return to our state. The challenge that GHHI has in front of it now is how do we tie that money that we've created in that economic return to truly be invested and owned and controlled by the communities who have been impacted uh, by this toxic legacy. And uh, so a lot of our work is looking at how do we bring the health dollars, utility dollars, bank dollars through CRA, in addition to HUD dollars and CHIP dollars and others, and, and to expand this work. <clears throat> and to build lead in all policies by looking at the other things in housing uh, that cause environmental health impacts, asthma reduction, where we're doing an $11 million project in East Baltimore called Breathe Easy uh, Baltimore, where we will be taking 1,500 kids who are missing school because of asthma, go back, assess their home, remediate their home, and track the performance on healthcare savings, on school attendance, on work attendance, and housing stability. We're doing that work uh, with support from the Maryland legislature, uh, the city of Baltimore, and in partnership with the Johns Hopkins School of Medicine, the Harriet Lane Clinic, and Living Classrooms, and would be happy to talk to people about our workforce development model, our equity investment model, um, and all of it built around this idea of aligning, coordinating, abrading and coordinating, sharing data, and ensuring a more thoughtful and efficient delivery service for families. We're working on projects like uh, the asthma reduction project that we started with the first uh, uh, public housing agency here in O'Donnell Heights, where we also trained and hired community health workers. That's been built out through our state contract where we're now training community health workers in lead and asthma and health-based housing in the nine counties surrounding Baltimore as well as Baltimore. Uh, but this is our charge as we pursue our national strategic plan on lead, which we are happy to share with you. Um, and as we look at places like Philadelphia, who is taking the laws that we just talked about here and trying to replicate them <clears throat> for one of America's largest cities. Um, and we're working in Congress uh, with a number of folks in Congress to try uh, our hand at establishing a $12.5 billion uh, lead remediation fund. So our organization is dedicated, like the Maryland Department has said, to the true eradication of lead poisoning and to really deliver on our promise uh, to end childhood lead poisoning as a major public health threat very soon. So I'm happy to take questions. I want to encourage folks to follow us on Twitter, uh, at Healthy Housing, or on our Facebook or LinkedIn page. Uh, and I really thank the National Center and the National Safe and Healthy Housing Coalition for letting us talk about the good works uh, that are ongoing in Maryland and uh, invite any of you to come and visit, go on a site visit with us, join us in a peer exchange uh, and in a cross-learning uh, throughout this country. So thank you. Great. Thank you, Ruthann, and thanks to all of our presenters. Uh, I do have a question here. It's sort of a two-pronged question, um, and I'll direct this to you, Ruthann, or anybody else can jump in if they want to. Um, so it reads, it appears that the new Maryland law automatically links case management requirements, uh, including environmental assessment, to the CDC reference value. Based on CDC's definition of the reference value, they could lower it to 3.5 micrograms per deciliter at any time. Um, how many more kids would have elevated blood lead levels in Maryland if this level were adopted? So that's the first question. 
And then the second part of the question is in high risk communities like Baltimore, wouldn't this dilute the focus, <clears throat> excuse me, dilute the focus on the highest risk housing? Um, for example, triggering expense, ex inspections at 3.5 would be expected to identify children who aren't in high risk housing. So I'll jump in first, but Kaylee, I welcome uh, you as well uh, uh, on, on this. Uh, we thought a lot about the, this, uh, but uh, it, let me let me say that the first shared value that we have at the state and the Maryland legislature, uh, and our really um, very good partners in the property owner community who are who share the value of primary prevention means no safe level uh, that we are trying to rid our homes of um, uh, exposure sources. Um, and that we have been a state that has been aggressive and it has paid off, not only in a $44.5 billion economic return, but our kids are doing better in school, they have better opportunities, we've lowered healthcare costs accordingly, and I think we have universally agreed in Maryland um, that uh, that, that the uh, nature of going toward zero is where we want to go. What we know is as we go lower in the preventive uh, blood lead level uh, tie-in for action, that the cost of the action is cheaper, uh, that we are getting better uh, maintenance standards from uh, properties, we are having better overall performance in lowering those maintenance standards and costs. We know uh, from uh, sheer data uh, that we've been able to lower the cost of compliance uh, over the years, both in the testing side and in the remediation side. Um, and so we are trying to drive that uh, down. But we also believe that every parent uh, should know the truth about the neurotoxin that is uh, presented to their child, to, the, to maybe perhaps themselves as, as pregnant women, and to, as to adults, um, and we are trying to prevent this neurotoxin uh, from damaging futures in competing in the classroom, adding to our roles in the criminal justice system, and lowering the economic opportunities and educational opportunities for our citizens. And I think that uh, there's a, a real commitment that the cost is marginal uh, in, uh, you know, the fiscal note for uh, the House bill that just passed uh, was less than it cost us to have one poison child um, in the state of Maryland. As for the numbers, uh, what we know is there's been, there's about a fourfold increase when you go from 10 to five, a four to five fold increase. I don't know that we've done that projection uh, yet, Kaylee, maybe you have, um, but it is something that we should do and publish. Um, yeah, that's yeah. This is Kaylee. I, I what Dan said, and I'll add a couple other things. I don't have off the um, top of my head of um, children that would follow the 0.5 and the 5, although we do receive blood lab results for um, all children that are tested, so we to, um, calculate that. Um, but two other things the bill that um, get at this issue. So. It does use the CDC reference level as definition PL. Um, if that level were to change again from the, the five down to 3.5, for example, the bill um, builds in a one year time period um, for that to be in Maryland, which would help us to ensure that resources are in place so that we can be successful and implementable if it does 0.5. Um, the other thing. The bill does um, change the modification obligation of standards so that it's triggered if um, if there's an EBL and mental investigation to that there was a um, effect in the prop that was creating the hazard. That kind of gets to the point of you know making sure that the um, resources that are being expended uh, and the solutions that are being recommended are actually tied to the um, hazards that are affecting that child. Okay, great, thanks. I have some other questions here. Uh, can you tell me if landlords' properties are included in remediation of their apartments with those fundings? 
how is Baltimore handling landlords? Um, could you say the question again, please? Yeah, it says, can you tell me if landlords' properties are included in remediation of their apartments with those fundings? How is Baltimore handling landlords? Sure. So uh, two things. The the biggest part of the Maryland or the the, the Maryland led uh, a risk reduction in, in housing law is targeted on rental properties. So the law that law is solely about rental property um, hazard remediation and risk reduction. Uh, so it is required uh, to be done. Uh, prior to occupancy and then in response to the notices of defect, um, if warranted. Uh, we do have a $4 million HUD grant. We also have uh, access to the $7.2 million a year from the Children's Health Insurance Program, as well as other housing funds in the state um, that are available to help reduce lead hazards. And in addition, um, owners are required to do this as part of the cost of their doing business if they um, need to build that into their maintenance standards as well. The combination of that strategic investment and uh, incorporating this as part of the essential maintenance practices for all rental housing units built before 78 in the state of Maryland uh, has uh, turned out really miraculous results, but they are clearly required um, to address these issues under the law. Okay, great. Thank you, Roseanne. And um, looks like we're coming up on time, but I will um, put one more question out and then the rest of the questions I can triage to the presenters and uh, we can get them out to our attendees. So for the last question, um, it says, this is for Ruth Ann. Thank you for sharing this great and thorough program. You mentioned that there is a housing choice voucher program for families who have lead problems in their rental unit. Um, how many have used this program and when did it start? Uh, so it started about, I wanna, uh, I'm going to get this wrong probably, but about a decade ago, we um, were able to secure this. Um, we started out with 75 vouchers. We then got our mayor to move it to 250. Um, so we have 250 vouchers dedicated to lead uh, poison children uh, and their families. The city did lower that um, to kids with lead levels over five a while back. Uh, Baltimore City's been targeted on the five uh, uh, threshold level for a while. Um, and so we're able to recirculate vouchers accordingly. Um, it has been a, it's been an incredible tool to add to our arsenal. We use it as the tool of last resort if we're not able to achieve this through relocation funds or rent court or other grant programs or a straight up uh, landlord compliance, property owner compliance. Um, but it's been uh, wonderful and we certainly would uh, be willing to share the contract documents and the process on that. Every uh, every uh, housing entity uh, has an ability uh, to set preferences and priorities for their housing choice vouchers. We were able to convince Baltimore that this was a, a priority that should be a preference. Okay, great. And actually, I'm gonna send one more question out. Um, Kaylee, I don't know if you wanna jump in on this one. It says, normally property owners are told that an environmental investigation will follow after having received the notice of elevated blood lead levels. If we are to start issuing them for level five and above in October of 2019, but no investigations until July, 2020, what do we tell to property owners in the interim? Um, so we've discussed that a little bit and we'll have to um, amend the standard that goes out to property owners for that period between October and um, October of this year and July of next year, the notification will um, be just that a note that they're aware that there there has been a child in the property that's been diagnosed um, with an elevated blood lead level five or above. Um, then we'll include language noting that starting in July, um, the law will be changing so that. It, environmental investigations will be done on all of those. So it'll it'll require a little bit of the standard documents, but um, 
we'll be making those changes. Okay, great. So we are up on time. I just wanted to say thank you everyone for joining and submitting really good questions. Also a special thank you to all of our presenters and our folks at GHHI for putting this all together. Um, a recording of the webinar will be shared with all attendees and posted online so you can go back over or feel free to share. Um, yeah, so thanks everyone for, for participating and have a great rest of your day. Thank you so much, and everybody remember that standards work. Thank you. Bye-bye.